I was in frontline combat numerous times. Uh, my life flashed before my eyes many times. I can think of dozens of times that I should have died. And I know I should have died, but God saved me. A brief synopsis of Paul Kidd. I can't go into all kinds of things, man. I, I can't go into them because it's too painful. I don't talk with, about anybody about my combat stuff. It's just, I've tried to talk in group therapy with the VA. I can't do it. It's just too painful and too horrible. So many things I've been through in my life. So many amazing things. And I just don't want to talk about a lot of stuff because I don't have a lot of time. I don't like to brag anymore, so I don't brag about things that I've been involved with that were really cool. And in the Marines, you've got a thing that's that's, that's really, it, I mean, it's, it will really wear you out. It's called a McCress. It's a timed march for 26 miles. you got a full backpack on, usually about 70 to 100 pounds plus. you got whatever weapon you carry with you in your combat boots and your, and your uh, camis, your fatigues. And you're, march, you're, you're marching so fast, you're almost jogging. And you're timing, you're timing that march to, to, to get under a certain time. And you get very few stops. And you get blisters all over your feet and you get wrecked. And a lot of times during that McCress, you'll look to your left or, your, or to your right, and you'll see a, a Marine who's, who's struggling. You, they don't, you don't think they'll make it. You have to finish as a team. You might end up taking their mortar plate, which is a big, huge, heavy metal steel round, steel round of contraption that you put that mortar tube I told you about in. Or they might have a, 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 an M60 uh, machine gun that, that, that's holding them down, or a lot of extra ammo. Whatever it is, you take that weapon from that Marine, and you say, I'll hump this for you for a while, Marine. You just keep your eyes forward. You keep your eyes focused on the prize. You keep marching forward until we get to the end of the race And in Panama, in the Panama invasion. And we weren't in the Panama invasion for the walkthrough in the city. We were in the jungle uh, at a place called the Arahan Fuel Farm. And there was a reinforced company of Marines. And we would fight night and day. We'd go on reconnaissance patrols in the morning and and we'd go sit in the ambush at night and we would constantly be engaging the Panamanian defense forces in the jungle and just wiping them out. We, we, we destroyed, we, we decimated their army, which is why the U.S. Army was able to walk through Panama City in the little joke for a couple of days. We were there for months and months and months fighting night and day. The first day I was there, a bullet went about an inch from my head, almost killed me. And my sniper up in a palm tree and we were constantly shooting snipers out of trees and, and people would, would trip wire, we hit the trip wire on our position when we were in the ambush at night. We'd get in a big firefight and just terrible stuff. And it was constantly seeing my life flash before my eyes. But see, your Marine will never leave a fellow Marine in alert. Your Marine will never leave a fellow Marine on, on a field of combat. He'll never leave a fellow Marine that's out in town that might be drunk and acting stupid. He'll snatch that Marine by the collar. He'll say, look, Marine. He'll say, look, Leatherneck, you come with me now. Get out of here. You're not going to stay here and act a fool. He won't leave him out there to be arrested by the police or get in a big brawl. He always watches his fellow Marines back. Some of you know, some of you don't. I served 20 years in the military defending this country, mostly with the Marines, with Recon, who is the Marines equivalent of the Navy SEALs, Army Rangers, Green Berets, etc. Also with the Grunts, Infantry. And saw a lot of frontline combat. Saw a lot of combat missions where we would go out and fight. And first Gulf War, I was one of those who got really sick from all the poison they injected in my veins. <coughs> Excuse me, you'll hear me cough, my voice get rough. Went through a lot over there. Most of my buddies are dead. Most, a lot of them died in the first several years of things like Lou Gehrig's disease and Parkinson's and things like that. And those of us who remained are, are getting smaller in number who actually were in the front lines getting all the poison injected into us, we're not doing too good. We're still alive though, and we're still kicking. And since that time, we came back from the war in 91, having all kinds of problems, all kinds of medical problems, all kinds of emotional problems, all kinds of mental problems dealing with severe post-traumatic stress disorder from seeing and doing things in combat that makes movies like Saul and Hostel seem like uh, old Disney classics like Bambi and Snow White. Scary, terrible things. In the Marine Corps, the choice weapon for a Marine Corps sniper is called a Barrett 50 caliber rifle. And it is a, it, it's a monster, man. It's a huge, huge, huge round. 
And the rounds, if they anywhere they hit you in the body is a kill shot. If it hits you in the, on the arm, it'll kill you. Rip your arm off and you'll die of shock. If it hits you in the, in the midsection, it can cut you in half. They have a magazine that can hold 10 rounds. And you slap that baby in there. And you've got a spotter next to you. And that spotter is watching. He, he's looking. Checking for the windage. Checking for the range. Checking for all the variables for those bullets are, 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 are uh, firing. <clears throat> I learned a long time ago, you never try to judge someone until you walk a mile in their shoes. I am a walking, talking, living miracle. I have been in frontline combat with the Marines over and over and over and over again. I've seen and done many things that no human being should ever have to see or do over and over and over and over again. I should have died dozens of times. I've looked death right in the eye. I was an all-star athlete back in those days. Any sport you can imagine, football, baseball, softball, basketball, soccer, played all the sports. And I was really stuck on myself. I was re really arrogant and cocky and conceited. And then I was in the Gulf War not too long after that. And in the Gulf War with recon. And it was just a crazy experience. We were there well before the ground war, fighting in villages and fighting in the border between Iraq and Kuwait and all across the entire area. Constantly getting in firefights, getting, you know, seeing my life flash before my eyes, you know, almost being blown up by airplanes that are dropping bombs and just crazy stuff going on constantly. They used to call me a pack mule with the Marines. I would hump all my gear, I would hump other people's gear, and I would still be in the front of the pack. I mean, I just have a natural, big, strong body. I mean, and long legs that are strong, and a huge, strong upper body, and I could just hump it, man. I could just hump it like a mule, like a pack mule. Climbing up a mountain, going through the jungle, going through the desert. I don't care where it is. So when I joined the military, it was a vacation for me. Boot camp was a vacation. Being in the military was a vacation because my home life was hell. It was a living hell. And it was like a joke in the military, which is sad. And um, so I started out and did my boot camp stuff, my basic training. And pretty soon I ended up in combat. Ended up in combat. I'm a throwback to the old days. I'm not here to make friends on Facebook and YouTube. I carry with me what I learned and all my time with the Marines and I apply it to my walk as a Christian. And man, it has served me very, very well. As a watchman, that has truly served me well because I've learned that, that an awful lot of former Marines and former Army and former Navy and Air Force even are hardcore watchmen because they know what it's like to sacrifice. They know what it's like to get out there and be on the wall, be on the front line, be the point man. They know what it's like. Very interesting experience growing up where I grew up at. There was a lot of gang activity, a lot of murder, a lot of rape. Our homes, our home would be attempted to be broken into. Uh, our outside animals, dogs would get killed. They would try to steal our cars, steal our bikes. Whoever the gangs were roaming the streets would just constantly steal everything. It was just a really, really bad scene. And um, the cops didn't come around too dangerous for the cops to hang around at. The buses didn't go there too uh, dangerous for the buses to go, so I had to walk as a little boy probably about a mile and a half, two miles each way to school, to elementary school, and real bad environment there. And when I went to middle school, it was really bad because the middle school, they had to have off-duty cops to come and work at the hallways because girls would get raped in the hallways, people would sell drugs, there would be all kinds of violence and threats of murder and just terrible, terrible stuff. I had to walk about, eh, probably about three miles each way there. That was a real experience. I got in fights all the time and just just a terrible, terrible experience. You go to school and find out one of your friends got killed in a drive-by shooting, someone murdered someone. So you see the Marines? The Marines train. It doesn't matter if you're not on a six-month deployment, what you, what, what you call a pump or a float, sometimes it can be longer, sometimes you're three months, then you're in the field. You're training. You're out training, man. You are out in the field for, usually you get up on a early Monday morning, like at zero dark 30 we say, like one or two in the morning, you head in, draw your weapon, draw your chow, and by the time you're ready, you're, you're humping out to, the feet, out to the field or you're being trucked out. And next thing you know, you're in the field all week and you come back in on a Friday. You're constantly training. 
you'll go to cold weather training. We have a huge cold weather training spot up in, in Bridgeport, California. We have mountain training. The best mountain training place I've ever been is the Rock Marines, Republic of Korean Marines in South Korea. You've got jungle warfare everywhere. You've got it in the Philippines. You've got it in Okinawa. Jungle warfare is, is, is fierce. You've got desert warfare everywhere around the world as well. And you're constantly, constantly, constantly training for battle. You're, you, it, it, when you're not fighting a war, you're training for a war. Reconnaissance missions and different types of, of combat missions that were hush-hush and, and top secret and, and just almost die so many times in training and in the missions themselves and almost fell off of a mountain one time we were walking across a thin ledge and just by the grace of God I was able to, to reach up and grab a hold of a tree on my way down that was growing out of the mountain to be able to hang onto a branch and to be able to, to live and surviving uh, massive fires that, that are coming down on us, forest fires and stuff where you've got to, where the whole thing is it's getting to be ablaze and you've got to try to, to, to get under a, a thermal blanket to try to ride out a forest fire. Just so many crazy things going on in life, so many mad things that were happening and about to happen that just everywhere I went, like I said, I'd be training people around me getting their heads blown off by a, a stray round somewhere or getting getting just smashed by a tank and just crazy stuff all the time. I was just so close always to, to, to dying. Anytime you're in combat, you want to make sure you got your radio man and whoever the senior officer is, or if he's down, whoever the senior staff NCO who's enlisted man is, or, or the senior NCO, whoever it is, they can call in for, for, um, for cover support, for fire support from the air. I was given all kinds of experimental drugs in the first Gulf War, and most of my buddies who got those drugs are dead now. They died of things like Lou Gehrig's disease and Hodgkin's disease and things like uh, MS. When you're in frontline combat, man, you hold your ground against the enemy. You don't turn tail and run. If you're in a firefight and you're, you're outnumbered, they have, they have superior firepower coming down on you, and you're just getting just pummeled and inundated. And the, 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 the rounds are just flying in and hailing in and the mortars are hailing in and Everything possible is healing in. You know, planes are, are, are dropping bombs on you, on your position. You stand and you fight. You face forward and you look at the enemy and you keep on fighting and fighting and fighting. You don't turn tail and run. You make sure that you stand there. And the Marines to your right and your left, you tell them. You say, you stand fast, Marine. You keep fighting. You keep your nose to the grindstone. Because there's a lot of young Marines that are in combat that have experienced combat before. Sometimes they can get edgy. They'll fight, but they can get edgy and nervous. Well, anybody can get nervous in combat. Anyone who tells you they're not nervous in combat is a liar. But they can get really nervous and edgy if they're, if they're new Marines. You tell them, Marine, you remember what you were taught. You stand fast, and you just keep your eyes on the enemy. You just fight. You keep firing. But being life and death, not just in the streets with, you know, dealing with gangs and stuff. This is dealing with life and death with your life being on the line. And, and it seemed like everywhere I went, there was death. I'd be driving down the street, and there would be a, 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 a fatal car wreck with people in the car with their heads chopped off and decapitated from getting hit by something that went through the windshield and only a little baby surviving that had his whole skin peeled off his head and, and you gotta try to keep the baby alive until somebody can come and help and it's like everywhere I went I saw death everywhere I went I saw destruction and I just kept on with the fake phony backslidden garbage Christian life I came back to the Lord I would repent I'd fall away I'd repent I'd fall away. It was a yo-yo effect. The, the two main rounds that the Marine Corps uses for mortars are, are 60 millimeter and 81 millimeter. You've seen on the movies, I'm sure, where there's a big metal tube and someone will drop something into that tube and they'll turn their head away. That's what's called a mortar. That's a, a, a like a, a bomb that goes off in a certain distance and explodes. Those those long range and they, and they fire them long range to get at the enemy. I've got that military regimen, and I just think that I, I was a warrior. I was a warrior for the Marines. You talk to my family and friends, Paul Kidd walks to walk. I don't just talk it, I walk it. Lap. I've met many rock stars. I've met all kinds of stars of all kinds. I'm in my time, security work when I used to work at arenas. When I was with the Marines and we would do the personal security for all the big rock and roll stars everywhere. I've met all the living presidents and their, their wives and their widows at one point. And so many things the Lord has brought me through. So many things, I don't even care about meeting them. I'm not impressed by celebrity and by stars. I'm impressed with Jesus Christ.